Welcome to the Legal Academy, episode 12. I'm your host, Oren Kerr. My guest this week is Nicola Lacey, the School Professor of Law, Gender, and Social Policy at the London School of Economics. Professor Lacey has been a professor at the University of London at Oxford and now at the London School of Economics. She, did, she is a distinguished theorist of criminal law uh, and a feminist legal theory, uh, the author of several books. And the one I know best in my own library is the uh, celebrated biography of HLA Hart uh, that she authored. She's been a visiting professor at top US law schools, including uh, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and NYU. Uh, and so she has a, a wide range of experiences and is here uh, to talk to us about some of the differences in legal education and the roles of law professors uh, in, in different countries. So Professor Lacey, thanks so much for joining me. It's a pleasure, thanks for inviting me. All right, great. So I wanted to start with a, a broad sense of the differences between legal education in, in the U.S. And, and in England, sort of. Um, in the U.S., of course, uh, the legal education is it's all post-baccalaureate. It's all a graduate program, a three-year JD, where there's a one-year required set of courses of the common law courses. And then basically it's opened up and it's all electives after that. Uh, and it's all a very general legal education. People can take whatever courses they want and all sort of yeah. end up in the same place. And I have a sense that that is a quirky U.S. way of doing it. So um, how, how quirky are we compared well, to... Well, I think, you know, it depends. So quirkiness depends and the, it somewhat lies in the eye, of, the eye of the beholder, doesn't it? So, but we obviously, I mean, you've already named the, the absolutely key in framing difference, which is that our... our law degree students come in as undergraduates. I mean, some of them, a few of them may have done another degree first. Uh, in Australia, for example, they're very often doing a joint degree, like law and politics or arts law or something like that. But in, in England, probably, although there was an experimentation in the, in the 80s and 70s with, with joint degree subjects, mainly students are just doing an LLB, which is a sort of standard three-year undergraduate law course and they come straight from school or after year a year off and that obviously makes a huge difference in a number of different ways uh, you know there are lots of different ways I think it means that in some ways the sort of tenor certainly in the middle of my career because of course these things change over time as well but in the middle of my career I would say that that um, you know probably on average the motivation of um, undergraduate law students in England was a, a little bit less solidly vocational. I mean, they were all there to get a good education and get a good job, don't get me wrong. But they didn't really regard this as like their professional training in law or cognate to that. Um, and so, you know, degree programs differ a little bit in different universities, in fact, quite a lot in different universities. But essentially, they would all come in and the, the basic framework of, of is set to some extent by the legal profession in the following way that the legal profession uh, has until now it's actually just rejigging its rules and we still don't know exactly where they're going to end up but all the time I've been teaching the last 35 years um, the, the way it's worked is that the, the legal profession has said if you do an undergraduate law degree which is a qualifying law degree then you get one year off the professional training that you anyway have to do after your degree. So everyone who wants to be a lawyer in England has to do either, uh, has to do another, in effect, one year of exams outside the university. And then depending on that, when they become a solicitor or a barrister, a further kind of professional training, which involves kind of like an apprenticeship. Um, if they, go in without a law degree or without a qualifying law degree, they have to do two years of exams before the apprenticeship instead of one. So you can perfectly easily become a lawyer still in England without a, a, a law degree, but it takes you an extra year. Um, what makes a law degree a qualifying law degree is that it has to cover certain core subjects set down by the profession. So, you know, very obvious things like public law, torts, contracts, criminal law, um, those sorts of things, land law, property law. Um, and so even if you make them uh, voluntary, 
uh, in your program, the students will tend to opt to do them because they obviously want to have the option of having um, uh, of having that year out of their professional training should they decide to become lawyers. I think in the last, particularly since the great uh, the recession of 2008, um, the students certainly that I'm teaching at LSE uh, have become significantly more vocational in their orientation and intensely worried about their exam results and, uh, you know, very understandably. And um, but but we still have a good minority of students and perhaps even a majority of students who will experiment with some social science courses. Now, LSE is obviously slightly unusual because it's a, just a social science university. And actually, we have very liberal rules in terms of the, the courses, the options that students can take from other programs. So quite a quite a good proportion of our law undergraduates will have done a couple of social science courses. Um, but 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 increasingly they're very focused on their, on their law. Whereas you know in a way for you I think and in my experience of teaching I've I've mainly taught graduate students uh, in the states actually master's students but I have been at Harvard I was teaching an undergraduate course and um, I would say that that one of the really big differences as a teacher and presumably for the students as well is that. You've got this classroom with a, a range of interdisciplinary expertise, and that's really fun to use in your teaching. Uh, so that, that makes a very, very big difference. On the other hand, uh, I assume that almost no one chooses to come to law school in the States unless they in, intend to become a lawyer or some kind, do some kind of legally yeah. oriented work. Whereas we still have a lot of students who say they want to do law in order to uh, help people or make the world a pl better place. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of law students who aren't quite sure why they're there. But there, I, I think everybody in the U.S. at least has a sense of being a lawyer is one of the things they might want yeah. to do yeah. once they yeah, get yeah. there. So, so how, how then does this change the job of being a law professor in the U.K. system? So in, in, in the U.S., it's all, it's all teaching graduate students. Obviously, they're all professional students. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... Um, People may have a background of practicing law a little bit. Some now increasingly have PhDs, although the traditional model was more somebody who had gone to a top law school, practiced yeah. for a few years, wrote a law review article, and then sort of went on the, yeah. went on the teaching market. It, uh, I'm just really interested to know sort of is, is the path to becoming a law professor the same or similar or how, how do people become... Yeah. Get, get into the job of being an so, academic. So that, so it's okay. probably a bit different. I mean, um, and it's changed enormously during the course of my career. So at the beginning of my career, it was absolutely standard what you've just described. You know, somebody goes off, goes to the bar for a while, decides they'd like to come back, perhaps does it part time, perhaps combines the two for a while. But from about the beginning of my career, the, the, the legal academy was professionalizing is one way of describing it and essentially making more elaborate entry points. And now, I mean, I don't have a PhD and that was absolutely standard at the time I got my job in the, in the uh, early eighties. Um, but now you have to get some very elaborate exemption to be even eligible to apply for a job at, at any really good university, unless you have a PhD. Okay. Um, I mean, that will obviously depend on, we've got a, like you, a, a very sort of uh, graduated uh, hierarchy of law schools in a way, although nobody likes to admit that, but, uh, but certainly in any of the, the, the top half of universities, there's no way you would get a tenure track job without, uh, without a PhD. Um, and also the whole uh, business of career progression has become much, much more oriented to the evaluation of published research. I would say in the, in the last decade, there's been a bit of a movement back towards uh, valuing teaching more, but, but really from the, through the 80s and the 90s and the first part of the noughties, uh, there was a, a hugely developed infrastructure of encouraging and indeed, you know, requiring people, uh, incentivizing people to do published research um, in a way that wasn't really true. When I started out, it was just as acceptable to be a, you know, a, a well-known barrister on the side. So far fewer people now 
and I think you have more in the States, combine legal practice and uh, legal academy. And I think that's also because at the same time as this has been happening in the academy, the legal profession has become much more, you know, hard, you know, working much longer as probably become a bit more like your profession has been for longer. Uh, so we have typically we might we may well have in areas obviously it, it is somewhat shaped by the fact that we're in London so we have access to a lot of high grade practitioners so we have a lot of practitioners who come in as visiting professors of the practice to do uh, you know specialist bits and pieces of teaching but we have very very few practicing lawyers on the faculty okay okay interesting um, and then and then um, you mentioned research. What kind of research would people typically be doing? Is it, I mean, to the, is it theoretical work? Is it practice oriented work? This is obviously, it's difficult to make the comparison. Yeah. Be, but, but I'm just sort of interested, like, what, what kinds of things would be considered like the classic kind of article for a, an English legal academic to write? I think it's much more um, Catholic than it is in the States where really it's a sort of very clear, you've got to get your law review articles and maybe, you know, obviously if you're particularly in certain fields, books count, but um, you know, my sense is that particularly if you're on the job. So I'm, I, I feel this because I've got a, 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 a former PhD student who's on the American job market at the moment. So I'm very aware of what he feels he has to do. It's the second year I've been, been writing for him and he's, he, he is, he's an American student and he's in a, an American postdoc. Um, and he clearly needs to hit the law reviews. Um, whereas uh, with us, it's much more, uh, Catholic. Again, it's been changing a lot. Um, at the beginning of my career, I would say that the standard kind of um, legal research was very case oriented. It was very sort of common law oriented, pretty, pretty traditional stuff. But gradually, I mean, really with like your law and society movement, we've had a socio-legal studies movement and then a critical legal studies movement and a feminist theory movement and and we've we've accumulated journals to match so uh, we say that we don't have a hierarchy of journals and that, that isn't really true uh, there are some you know say five or six absolutely leading established peer-reviewed journals like the modern law review the oxford journal of legal studies the cambridge law journal, uh, the Law Quarterly Review, the sort of old established journals. They all have a slightly different take. Modern Law Review is a bit more law and society-ish. Uh, Oxford League Journal of Legal Studies is more legal philosophy-ish. Uh, LQR has been very sort of common law-ish, very, you know, very, very clever anal analytic uh, scholarship on law. Um, but uh, now we've, we've also got very, very well prestigious journals in law and social science, like Journal of Law and Society, just as you've got Law and Social Inquiry, Law and Society Review. Um, and so really it's, you can be doing doctrinal work, you can be doing philosophical work, you can be doing socio-legal work, you can be doing criminological work, that's fine. But increasingly, the evaluators want you and the people who are going to be promoting you want you to get it into peer-reviewed journals and we have a little bit of a struggle with US journals in our system because by our standards it's a bit of a laugh if you've published in them because you know that, that they're reviewed <laughs> within an inch of their lives but they're not technically peer-reviewed <laughs> You, oh, um, you mean the fac even the faculty edited journals, or you mean the student edited? I mean the student edited journals. Yeah, so I'm curious, how, how does the world of student edited law reviews look? Because there's certainly a lot of criticism within the U.S. We law yeah. professors, you know, and and lawyers look at this and go like, yeah. how yeah. how can you be in a world where students are making yeah. these decisions? This is so um, odd. I mean, and, it, it is regarded as. I mean, I had to have quite an argument at one point in my career with a promotions uh, committee that was proposing simply not to read somebody's work, it wasn't my work, somebody else's work that was in the Harvard Law Review because it wasn't peer reviewed. And I said, look, oh, come on, 
that is mad. You were saying that if Herbert Hart's positivism and the separation of law and morals have been up for <laughs> give me a break. But it is generally regarded as pretty bizarre. And I'll tell you a funny story. I, I did a, a piece for a, a symposium that Jeremy Waldron and Liam Murphy uh, ran on the hot, on the hot full of debate um, oh, a number of years ago. And I told in my piece the very, very funny story uh, about uh, Hart basically trying to withdraw positivism and the separation of law and morals from the Harvard Law Review because, as he put it in a letter to Long Fuller, the students had butchered it. <laughs> and um, Fuller had to sort of go and negotiate and do some firefighting. And I tell this story in the, in the piece, and my piece still came back butchered. <laughs> <laughs> You think, did they actually read this? So you, it is. You received the HLA heart treatment. That's. Uh, uh, I did. Well, I, well, I don't think I, I don't know quite bad how bad it <laughs> was, but you know, certainly they rewrote my article in a way I wasn't very happy about. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's, it's so funny these cultural differences. They're really extraordinary, aren't they? Yeah, they they are they are remarkable. I mean, I, I th and I think in the U.S. the sort of the development of school specific student edited journals is this sort of quirky yeah. process yeah. in yeah. a world where everything was really localized if you know if you were the state law school you focus on state law for some period of time yeah and then and then and then maybe the system is just so huge where eventually you end up with you know hundreds of law schools and hundreds if not now thousands of journals mm -hmm. and so they're all general journals right or most of them are and the yeah. idea of specialty journals itself is yeah. a little bit kind of quirky so it's a very odd system um uh, i think we, we certainly realize that and and, 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 I guess and also the, the other thing that strikes us as completely bizarre is that you're told on some of the sort of advice things if you're submitting through the electronic press system or whatever that the one of the most important things you submit is your cv <laughs> what that that for europeans and australians that is just completely bizarre even though of course we know that you know it's not as though our system completely filters out those sorts of biases but but essentially it's a pretty serious system the the, the, the peer review system yeah yeah, uh, submitting CVs, uh, uh, that strikes me as equally strange coming from within the system. That's, sort of, <laughs> it's, that's one of those, you're not supposed to talk about that part or like, just go Google it if you really want to know. Making that a formal requirement always struck me as really, really uh, sort of, a, it, it's a confession of uh, lack of rigor or a confession of inability to figure it out on the merits yeah. Um, yeah. At, at some level. Um, so, so how about um, just like the, well, like what would a typical teaching load be of a mm. of a an English? It's, that's law very course. difficult to answer because if you were at one of the um, less well well funded law schools with huge numbers of students, you might be doing I don't know, maybe one and a half to two times what I do, which is about a normal load at LSE works out at about ten hours a week. Okay. So it's expressed as a number of hours. Over, over a whole year. The beginning of my career in Oxford, I was at New College uh, from 1984 to 95. And at that point, there was still very much, I think this was in the, it's a good index of what's happened with professionalization. Typically an Oxford or Cambridge tutor in, you know, up until the eighties would have been teaching five, six, seven different subjects you know, being a generalist of the common law was where it was at. Yeah. And I was teaching public law, Roman law, criminal law, criminal justice, human rights, you name it. And it's absolutely, you know, I, it's actually a bit embarrassing uh, <laughs> given that I, you know, I was that never a Roman law scholar. Um, and it was really during that second half of the 80s that people started swapping with each other, swapping their students so that they could have a more rational, concentrated teaching load at the cost of a lot of repeat teaching. But sometimes in Oxford, I was teaching 20 hours a week, of course, in very small groups. So the, the, mark, the grading wasn't as... Um, so, but the other thing is we don't have TAs formally. So we do all our own grading. Okay. And... Uh, 
and yeah so that's and a very big difference i want to make sure i understand one thing so 10 10 hours a week versus 20 hours a week is that 10 credits per year altogether is that five five hours per week per semester or is it even even so no so, so in a, i mean what i mean is that over the course of the whole year academic year i would be expected if i didn't have any leave to teach something like 120 hours and that would be made up of different kinds of components um, it doesn't include my my graduate students unless I have more than so many. It's all you know. There's a formula for all this. There's this huge culture of transparency, which, needless to say, doesn't work entirely well. But but you know, it's a decent aspiration that we all know what everybody else teaches. Um, but it, the actually what that means in terms of your workload is can be can be quite different, and there there are ways of compensating that for this. so if i were a banking lawyer or a commercial lawyer um you know i i might have 80 students in my llm class and that's obviously in terms of the grading a huge extra lot of work um and so there are ways of compensating for that but the way we calculate the loads in the first instance is just in terms of contact hours so it might be a lecture or a seminar yeah. Okay. And then is, is the grading um, based on one final exam? Is it typically based on many tests during the- That, that also is very much in flux. So traditionally it has been one three hour uh, unseen exam. Uh, of course, this year we had to go to, uh, in effect, online take home exams. It's very, very interesting innovation. Right. I've been, ever since I taught last at MIU in 2003 and used ExamSoft, I've been campaigning at LSE to get exams online. It's always been, oh my goodness, we've had pilot studies, we've had reviews. It's never happened until this year and it happened sort of overnight because of the pandemic. Um, so uh, I, but we, even before that, we had been massively diversifying our assessment methods. So just to give you examples, so two of my courses are still taught by exam, examined by, by traditional exam, but the undergraduate optional course I teach in criminology, I examine by grading a, a student presentation in class and um, also uh, giving them a you know, take home research paper in effect. Okay. A, a, a question I also had was, to what extent does specifically in in the english system to what extent does the law of other jurisdictions factor into kind of the world view of whether students or other academics because i think the the way i sort of this is hard to generalize but within the u.s system there's like you know the united states right? and granted it's all derived you know the the origins will be english common law and so the first year students yeah. will be reading yeah. Uh, you know, 17th century cases, Rex versus Chizer or something like that. And, those, yeah. you know, everything, they're, they're aware of everything originally coming from England, but there's sort of a yeah. sense of, you know, 1776 comes and we say, we're incorporating the common law, but we're doing our own thing. And, yeah. and then after that, the law of other jurisdictions comes up in international law courses yeah. specifically, yeah. or comparative yeah. law courses, but yeah. otherwise is not yeah. kind of on the radar yeah. screen. And, and, and is that so that, that would also kind of US specific or, or that, that would have been a very good characterization of what things were like when I did my law degree in the late 70s. I, I did international law and a, a marvelous course called Introduction to Socialist Legal Systems, which was a real uh, period piece. But if you didn't opt to do those things, you really didn't learn anything about anything other than uh, other than a little bit about the American Constitution, which of course we, we were terribly envious of because, you know, there was, some, there was a sort of feeling and it was very controversial among English public law academics as to whether, you know, we were better because we didn't need a written constitution and then more probably more people on the centre left were sort of like, why haven't we still got a written constitution? So, um, but that was probably the main uh, point of contact um, 
But now, I mean, really, so when I, uh, to contextualise when I was a student, although we were then happily a member of the EU, we, st we didn't have e European law as a compulsory subject, and European law was only just beginning to impinge on English law. But of course, that has been a, just a massive change, because now you can't do any area, and this will continue even after Brexit, uh, you can't do any area of law, teach any area of law without teaching some European law and making the students aware of the interaction between different legal systems, national and transnational. Uh, the European Convention of Human Rights has also had a big impact on the substance of the common law um, via the Human Rights Act particularly, but a bit before that as well. And so, I, so for example, I teach, um, I had quite a long period when I wasn't teaching, I was in various research positions. And when I came back into teaching, I decided not to go back into teaching criminal law, which I taught all my career, but to take up a course in this, the, the bog standard introductory course in legal systems, which I co-teach with, with Neil Duxbury and with a very nice German lawyer called Jaco Bomhoff. And we'd always, they'd always had a sort of module of comparative legal systems in that. And what we've tried to do um, is really build that through so that, for example, instead of just having how legal interpretation, statutory interpretation, precedent work in English law, why it's different in France and Germany, to really try and situate that within the broader institutional, cultural, constitutional differences. So that, for example, when I teach the course on lay participation in the legal system, we talk about things like jury nullification. Jury nullification has a really different resonance in the States from what it does in, in England. And that has, you know, that tells us something really important about, about the way those systems are embedded in their broader institutional and political infrastructure. So uh, do I think the students are that interested? <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure. <laughs> And it's odd because at LSE we have an incredibly international student body and we have loads of students from Far East. We have quite a few European students. We have a smattering of Australians and Canadians, but they, they want to learn English law. <laughs> right. uh, w one theme that I've often um, hit on in the interviews of this show in particular has been um, faculties in the US, which may range from say, 30 members of a law school faculty to upwards of 80 or 90 yeah. members yeah. of a law school faculty. The, the difficulty of faculty members knowing and understanding what their colleagues are doing yeah. in a world where it's so splintered and the um, law and economics professor focuses on one thing and the critical race theorist focuses on another and the legal historian on a third uh, and the doctrinalist may on a fourth. And, and you'll have people coming through, especially for talks, um, uh, or, or even job interviews in which um, nobody, there's a very small group of people who actually understand what the person mm -hmm. is saying. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are generalists trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. is, is that also true in your experience mm -hmm. in English law schools or is there more of a common route that people may have? You mean a common route in terms of what they bring to the, yeah. A, a common background, a, yeah. a common set of assumptions. Is, is, the, is the academic work, the research that people are doing something which is comprehensible to their colleagues? Or yeah, is it so, also so specialized that it's... Right, uh, I think that's becoming that, you know, with professionalization and, uh, you know, we've had a proliferation of, of much more specialist courses, uh, particularly in areas like banking law and so on. Um, I, I think it's become more of a challenge and I suspect that, um, you know, that, that will go on becoming more difficult. In, uh, in my department, so I don't know really how widespread this is, but I think it's still reasonably uh, common. We have one faculty sem research seminar. It happens every week at the same time. Every other week it's faculty. Every other week it's PhD students. You get very good attendance. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just an hour. You read the paper beforehand. Mm -hmm. And... The, you know, the aspiration of that seminar really is institution building and everybody is asked to present their work in a way that should be accessible to an intelligent law academic. 
And I do think that, um, of course, people have incredibly different assumptions and use very different methods. And some people, you know, we haven't got quite the law and economics and other things split that you have. But, but you know, there are, of course, ideological splits in the way people think about how to study law, particularly between people who uh, think that empirical studies are a very central part and people who don't. But I would say one of the reasons I particularly like my department is that it operates on uh, the assumption that one of our most important responsibilities is to try to attend to each other's work. And in particular, as the, the, the academic world has become ever more competitive, really, and tough, the younger people are so much tougher now for people coming up than it was for me. Nobody asked me what I was going to, you know, what my research trajectory for the next five years was or how I evaluated my performance over the last year. I mean, you know, the amount of accounting that we do, and we'll come to that because that's another big difference as well, um, is extraordinary. And I think one of the things we probably old lags like me feel very strongly is that if you don't have that kind of generalized research culture, it's very hard to do appropriate mentoring to really help people along and, and have a sense of how they're getting on and um, yeah and so we try to keep but of course there are there are you know as specialists my colleagues who are working on Bitcoin I struggle. <laughs> I, I wanted to turn to the question you, you just mentioned uh, the, the counting question and I've, I've heard of, of this in, in, in UK law schools mm. and among UK academics of everything needing to be counted for credit mm. purposes or for if you could explain more what that what that means that'd be great. Well um, I think what one way sort of a, at a macro level of understanding what's happened uh, in English universities generally it's not just law schools is that the the sort of opening up and expansion and dereg ostensibly putting our, us out on the market, becoming much more like private universities in the US, um, has been accompanied in an in a interesting, and, and it's, it's what David Garland, our colleague at NYU, would call sort of governments that are dis, government at a distance, or Jonathan Simon would have a good line on this, you know. Um, it's been accompanied by actually an intensification of state control and oversight in various ways. So, you know, yeah, we can go out, we can charge what fees we can get away with and we can, you know, expand or contract and we can decide how we allocate our places, but we must do X, Y and Z in order to count as an institution that gets the government subsidy that is allowed to take, get uh, overseas students eligible to get visas. I mean, they have quite a lot of controls over us. So the first um, iteration of that was the so-called research assessment exercise. Oh, back in the, I can't even remember, maybe the, the 90s. And it started as quite a light touch. Everybody had to just sort of give a list of their publications every five years. Then it became much more focused. You had to give, let's say, four pieces over five years, and they were really intensively reviewed at a national level. Um, and then each faculty had to give a sort of res research environment statement, a statement of how it educates PhD students and creates the next generation. So it's become more and more and more elaborate. Now, not surprisingly, uh, at that time when everything was becoming more research focused, there was a temptation to put a lot of your eggs, particularly in recruitment terms, in, in the research basket. And then the government decided that we weren't doing enough by way of telling them what wonderful teaching we were doing. So they created a parallel infrastructure at national levels, and regional levels. Um, to oversee teaching, which is called the Teaching Evaluation Framework. And that is super elaborate. Um, so, um, and I won't start, I won't go into it, but it's very, very elaborate. And you spend, one of the things that uh, to me is very unsatisfying about it is that you spend a, an awful lot of time not doing what you're doing, but, or planning what you're doing, but telling somebody how you're gonna do it and then saying how you did it, <laughs> that sort of thing. And now, as if that wasn't enough, we're about to be hit with a KEF, which is a knowledge exchange framework. Do we do, do a good job doing like what you're doing now? Outreach, uh, you know, blogs, 
podcasts, uh, things with the community, external programs, summer schools, all that sort of stuff, public events. Um, so we're very busy telling the government and each other <laughs> what, what we're about to do, when, when we've done it and how well we did it. And, and of course, it's all translated into metrics of one kind or another. So that's another wonderful game. Uh, it's a, it has got quite out of hand. And I, I think that relates at the level of your experience as a law school teacher to what to me was the most palpable difference in my periods of visiting Yale and, and Harvard and NYU, um, which was the, the, just the blissful freedom of being, you know, getting an email from somebody in July saying, Hi, Professor Lacey. I'm just reaching out to see if you're ready to share your course outline and materials, and then we'll get it all sorted out for you in terms of a reading pack or electronic readings or whatever. And it's super like, whereas, frankly, if I want to so much to change the title of my course at LSE, it's like the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> I have to fill in forms. I have to go to be interrogated. Um, I had to, so I teach a course with a colleague called uh, Explaining Punishment, Philosophy, Sociology and Political Economy. And, uh, and this is very funny because I'd actually been hard when I designed this course. I'd been hard to teach in an interdisciplinary way. And I was hauled up in front of the committee to justify to the sociologists, the, the economists and the philosophers as to why I was allowed to use those words in my teaching. <laughs> is this a, a my, government of my course. What? It, this was, is this the government requirement or is this just school? No, that's an LSC elaboration. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the government does a lot to us and then we do a lot more to ourselves. That's, that's the way it works. <laughs> And is is the and so I gather the impetus for the the case for that regulation, or at least where it started from, is a sense yeah. of this is a public function and so it should be done in a public yeah. way. Yeah. And, and what do you think the the impact of it actually is? So is it serving that public well, function, or is it just a bunch of paperwork? I have to put my hand on my heart and say I think that people work a, a lot harder on average in the legal academy now than they did at the beginning of my career. I mean, maybe even it's gone a bit over the top. I think people work quite frightening as, particularly younger people. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think it's perfectly fair enough that we should have accountability for what we do. Um, you know, at the beginning of my career, we didn't even have any kind of student evaluation system or anything like that. Uh, so clearly there was need for rebalancing, but I think it's gone, it's become, dysfunctional in the sense it's quite demotivating. Some people just get really overwhelmed and it invites a certain kind of box ticking. Um, and some people just give up and opt out and they stop, you know, uh, they just vote with their feet. But mostly people are incredibly compliant. And I think we spend a lot of time doing things that don't really enhance what we call the student experience. Um, they, they just uh, provide a piece of paper. It reminds me, I was doing a piece of research many years ago with a colleague where we were interviewing people running uh, what were called sort of safer cities partnerships. In other words, we, these were uh, areas of multiple deprivation which have got public funds from the EU or the government to do various things, including crime prevention. And we were particularly interested in crime prevention. And what we discovered was that what they were doing was that they knew that what they really needed to, to do was social crime prevention, work in schools, try and improve housing, that sort of thing. Uh, but they couldn't make that into metrics. And so they spent a lot of their time devising ridiculous things and they knew they were ridiculous uh, that were easily countable and I think there's a real danger of that with universities uh, with any with any really really over audited you know I have a wonderful colleague at LSE called Mike Power in the accounting and finance department who wrote a book called the audit society he wrote it about 20 years ago how prescient really <laughs> and, and um, a last question because unfortunately we're, we're, we're getting yeah, yeah, short, yeah, short yeah, on yeah. time yeah. Um, uh, so career paths, I'm sort of interested in the question of um, retirement and um, how, how careers sort of reach their natural end. Um, yeah. So typically, at least in, in, this, in the U.S., it might be maybe somebody becomes a 
tenure track professor at, I don't know, they're 30, maybe something around yeah. there, 30, 35. Um, and then they, the tenure track is maybe five years. And then at U.S. law schools, the tenure rates are quite high. And then people, there's no mandatory retirement and people can hang on for as long as, you know, you could have somebody in well into their 70s before they uh, retire. And then there's emeritus professors that are um, doing some amount, although it varies and some sort of at that point stop stop working some continue. I'm curious, is it, is it similar that long career path in the English system yeah. as it is yeah. in the US? Yeah, right? so I mean we used to have a very sort of standard career path where we had a, a statutory retirement age at 65 and it was varied a bit from university to university but that was basically it. Uh, EU law age discrimination legislation got rid of that about a decade ago. So um, so now universities have are having to devise ways to manage people's end of career time and uh, most many many people go sort of go part time and then a bit part of time and 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 perhaps go on till more you know more like they their seven, 70s but um i think that's it's a bit early to say how that will play out in the longer term but generally is it, there are fewer people, I would say, than at the beginning of my career who do secondments of one kind or another, maybe go off, have a doorstep tenancy at the bar and take some time out to work on a very big case or something like that, or go off to the Law Commission uh, for a while, which is the national body, law reform body, all those sorts of things. Um, we do sometimes have people go on secondments overseas. Uh, so we had one of our banking lawyers went off to advise the Greek government on the bailout scheme, for example. Um, so, but I think on the whole, uh, people, when they get their academic job, they get one they, they like and their career is going well, they will stick with it and have long careers. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like, um, just, I'm just thinking of the big picture here. It sounds like uh, the the experience of English academics and the experience of U.S. academics within law specifically, they're kind of on parallel tracks and that they're, they're being influenced by similar changes, the mm. increasingly sort of academic, you know, less practitioner oriented, more academic uh, over time. Uh, si similar experience where, you know, in terms of retirement, there used to be a mandatory retirement age and then it became understood to be age discrimination and so that that has created a new problem and a uh, new new dynamic and it, it sounds like they're they're different systems and yet they're actually being kind of subject to some similar pressures whether I think, that's I think in some ways our system has become in some ways it's become more like yours it's been more subject to the kinds of pressures that you've been as putting in the private sector have been dealing with the university system of the states have been dealing with for a long time um, I, mean, you, you, I guess that the very, very wealthy universities and states have been cushioned from those effects by their endowments. But obviously, you, you're in Berkeley. There's been it's a very different situation with the state state funding and the California budget and so on. So I think, but I think it, w the way we've reacted in terms of the auditing strikes me as quite um, quite particular. Um, and yeah, I hope you don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we don't either. That sounds horrible. <laughs> it is, you know, it's funny in the, in the U.S. system, in different, I've been now at, I guess, three law schools, and, and they vary in terms of their practices, but usually there's some sort of a requirement at the end of the year, you file some sort of an internal report saying, this is what I did the last year. And, you know, the the, it might be I, I wrote two law review articles and I gave the following speeches or whatever. It might take, you know, a few hours to do. And, oh, you, you, you know, the professors react like you, it's unbelievable what they were made to, you know, like all this paperwork they had to go through. And, you know, that's a day <laughs> compared yeah. to what you're describing. It sounds yeah. like a, yeah. a very yeah. different yeah. world yes. in that no, regard. And, and the same with, you know, with examining and so on. You, everything has to be double marked. It then has to go to an external examiner. I mean, it is, it is absolutely, you know, it's, 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 it's very rigorous. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Nicola, this was incredibly interesting. I want to thank you for, uh, for I've coming. I've enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for being flexible about the time and so on.
Absolutely. This was, it was wonderful to have you on. And uh, when I was looking for somebody to give a, a different perspective, you know, from a different, uh, different country, I was trying to find someone when I saw, I, I, I've been, I loved your book on heart and I've, you know, you're, you're one of the few, you're, 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 you're a presence within U.S. law schools. You're a, a known, you you're, I think widely just universally recognized as just doing incredibly interesting work. And I really appreciate you being uh, able to come on. Oh, that's very kind of you. Good luck with your series. Thank you. Take care.